Welcome to Belmont Poetry Night. I'm Monica Corday, your host and the Poet Laureate of Belmont, California. We meet on the third Tuesdays of every month to celebrate the spoken word as makers, listeners, and admirers of poetry. We come with featured guests sometimes and an open mic always. And although we may still not be at our favorite physical venue, the Belmont Library, uh, since the pandemic, our thriving poetry circle has transitioned to this virtual space. And I'm grateful this allows me to welcome poets and listeners from across the globe. Uh, so thanks for joining me and Zooming in. I'd love to know where you all are, all are joining me from. So please share in the chat. Um, and uh, many of you know, each month I curate these poetry nights uh, with an intention centered on community in connection with the literary arts, uh, highlighting the artist or the maker of the craft. And I have curated tonight's poetry night in the theme, Resonating Voices, honoring uh, the Asian American Pacific Islanders Heritage Month observed through May. And with my featured poet, my hope with this offering is to invite everyone uh, to take time to recognize, uh, reacquaint and remember RP communities, diverse voices which have been resonating through poetry. Uh, like this poem here, uh, I'd like to share uh, to open this evening with. And the poem is written by Lee Young Lee, an American poet who was born in Indonesia to Chinese parents. And the poem is called, I Ask My Mother to Sing. I Ask My Mother to Sing by Lee Young Lee. She begins and my grandmother joins her. Mother and, and daughter sing like young girls. If my father were alive, he would play his accordion and sway like a boat. I've never been in Peking or the summer palace, nor stood on the great stone boat to watch the rain begin on Quin Ming Lake, the picnickers running away in the grass. But I love to hear it sung, how the water lilies fill with rain until they overturn, spilling water into water, then rock back and fill with more. Both women have begun to cry, but neither stops her song. Thank you. Uh, in, in one of his readings of this poem, uh, Lee shares his thoughts on how he grew up listening to songs his mother used to sing uh, that her mother taught and how these were songs about a country he had never seen, but a country in which she was born. And I feel that through this poem, he revisits that childhood memory and explores the beauty and depth and uh, also something of a loss. Uh, these songs bring to him now. Uh, my featured poet tonight, uh, Shikha Malavia, also explores the history, uh, her culture, the language and identity through her poems. And you will hear this soon in her reading and our conversation taking forward the theme of this evening. Uh, let me introduce her first. Shikha Malavia is an Indian American poet writer and publisher. She is co-founder of the Great Indian Poetry Collective, a mentorship model press publishing powerful voices from India and the Indian diaspora. Her poetry has been nominated for the Pushkart Prize and featured in Catamaran, Plume, Prairie Schooner, and other fine publications. Shikha has been a featured TEDx speaker and was selected as Poet Laureate of San Ramon, California in 2016. She has been an AWP, Association of Writers and Writing Professionals Poetry Mentor in their Writer to Writer program for six seasons and is currently a Mosaic America Fellow. Committed to cultural collaboration in the San Francisco Bay Area, 
and beyond. Her book of historical persona poetry, In Her Own Voice, Poems of Anandibai Zoshi, is forthcoming in 2023. Her previous book of poems is Geography of Tongues. Shikha, uh, it was love at first reading when I attended one of your past poetry readings and I'm elated to have you with us tonight. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Monica. It's um, an absolute honor to be here and to be amongst all of you. And even though it's online, I do feel like we are all in a room together. So thank you, thank you so much. And um, it's especially really nice to be uh, able to do a reading during this month where we're celebrating um, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So uh, thanks for that as well. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Perfect. And uh, if you'd like to start uh, uh, off with a poem of yours, that would be great. Sure. OK, so I will be reading a poem, which is um, from my book, Geography of Tongues. And let me see if it will show here, show up here, ghostly, but there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this book came out in 2014, and uh, most of the poems actually were written in my 20s and 30s, and a few in my 40s. So um, I'm now 50. So it is, you know, when I read these poems, it's like revisiting version of my younger self and um, the issues I was trying to negotiate. You know, those. Um, you know, I'll just share it with you and um, time traveling a little bit <laughs> through poetry. Um, <clears throat> So this first poem, as a child, I often got asked, where do you come from? And, um, you know, I've, I felt like I was from so many places, like from England, because I was born in England, but from the United States as I grew up in the Midwest, but also because my heritage is Indian. Um, so this poem was sort of a response to the, all of the contradictions that I come from, and the land where I come from is such a contradictory place. So where I come from. My country is rough silk. My country is smooth spice. My country is black silver. My country is blue ice. My country is lotus temple. My country is golden mosque. My country is brick church. My country is glass synagogue. My country is tame elephant. My country is hungry, hungry tiger. My country is jumping monkey. My country is scuttling spider. My country is scented flower. My country is smelly dung. My country is ahimsa. My country is loaded gun. My country is every manifestation between a fiery red chili pepper and your tongue, a peacock dancing against the setting sun. Absolutely amazing. And such a powerful piece at that, uh, Shikha. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I see that uh, you are traversing different cultures through words. And I was thinking of the lines, uh, my country is ahinsa. And ahinsa in the Hindi language means nonviolence. Uh, my country is loaded gun. Uh, like you said, it is full of contradictions, the lines. and. Uh, the poem is part of a school textbook also, if I'm right. Yes, uh, actually, I was really um, pleasantly surprised when I got an email, uh, I think when the pandemic had just begun actually, saying we'd like to feature your poem in a textbook in Norway for um, high schoolers. And, you know, I was really thrilled. And this poem's a very simple one. And <clears throat> it's almost like a list poem, right? Like where I'm mm -hmm. listing um, different qualities of my country. But the juxtaposition of the images I feel is what really brings the power in the poem. And so, um, and I love imagery. I've always loved imagery. So um, I was, you know, and, and when you go to a place like India, the imagery can be startling and it can be stunning and it's right in your face. So I wanted to try and convey that in the poem itself. But um, I, so I asked them though, like, you know, this was somebody I didn't know and I didn't know anybody who knew them. And I asked them, you know, where did you get this phone from or how did you find out about it? And so it was somebody in Minnesota whom I don't even know, thank you, wherever you are, who recommended it to this person. And somehow that poem went 
to Norway. So it, it was, that is really absolutely funny. brilliant. Yeah. It is brilliant. And and my question to you was, uh, did you also connect with poetry when in school? Uh, what was a pivotal moment that drew you to the art of making poetry? Uh, well, a um, couple of things. Yes, in school, I was introduced to it in third grade. And um, I was just drawn to it from the beginning. But my mom, when we were young, we, I grew up in Minnesota, and we used, um, my mom used to buy a bunch of books from garage sales. So one of the books that she bought was The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, who is a Lebanese American writer. And that book somehow, even though I was a young child, I think I was about eight or nine, but something about the book, the mysticism of it, the lyricism of it, it just drew me in. And when I read it, I thought, you know what? I want to write like this. How does one do this? So it, it was almost like, you know, uh, when you cast a reel, when you're fishing, you know, it drew me in like, you know, <laughs> like somebody casts a, a reel and, you know, hooks the fish. I was like totally hooked. So I don't know. I mean, some people, you know, like to say it's a calling or whatever it is. I don't know, but that's what it was for me. So it, it happened very early for me. Yeah. Uh, that's beautiful and we are lucky to uh, to hear uh, the art in the in the process so thank you for sharing that uh, yeah. if if we, Ashika you'd like to go ahead and share yeah. another piece yeah. before I have another question for you sure. so this next poem um, so in my book geography of tongues um, most if not all of the poems are autobiographical and this one is based on um, a visit I had um, I took my daughter to the pediatrician and um, we had just come back from India and she was talking in our native language which is Hindi and she was speaking very rapidly. So the doctor who <clears throat> was um, a Minnesotan, he remarks to me that, oh, you know, she has, your daughter has that rapid tongue thing going. And I was like, what does that mean? And so I guess my message here is like, be careful what you say in front of a poet or a writer because you never know what they're gonna turn it into. <laughs> so, a rapid tongue thing going. Dear Mr. White Male Caucasian Pediatrician, flattening my daughter's tongue and paring down her throat while remarking, she has that rapid tongue thing going. The tongue that you call rapid has a thousand fires in it and a thousand showers of lotuses. Perhaps we do speak as if we have to catch a train. Each word is poised at an overcrowded station on our tongues, bound for India and back within milliseconds. With our clove and cardamom scented breath, we spread the fragrance of our pungent lives. And in the span of a minute, we find out how auntie is doing after the flash flood in her village and when the next sari sale will be, or where the best bitter gourds are available, or how the thesis on language acquisition is going. A rapid tongue can trace the world in one lick with the force of a ghost chili kick. So next time, please don't ask me why we talk so quickly, so harshly, so loudly, unless you want to ask nicely. Woohoo! <laughs> Love that piece. And uh, and in many of your poems, uh, Shikha, I see that there is this recurring image or metaphor for the tongue uh, right. and, and you will hear it in some of uh, her the next poems that Shikha reads I'm sure uh, the imagery uh, that you love to work with I I see that it is quite sharp and and searing but uh, stunning at the same time and mm -hmm. I'll quote a few lines from uh, all the different poems you just like the couple of poems at least uh, that you read right now uh, your tongue a peacock dancing against the setting sun or the line which says, each word is poised at an overcrowded station on our tongues bound for India. Uh, my question is, do you rethink of home through the language you use and, ident and how you identify yourself with that language? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, rethink, is that what you said? Yes. Or reimagine? I mean, I am thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of things going on and one is recreating and regarding like the symbolism of the tongue. So to me, it was very powerful to find out that babies, when they're learning about the world, 
they learn everything through their tongue because they put everything in their mouth. And, you know, as parents, we're like, no, no, don't put that in your mouth. That's not good for you. But because of all the nerves we have, you know, and the taste buds we have, it's not just for eating, it's for processing so many different things. And to me, that was so powerful. And when we when we talk about language, we say mother tongue. And so why do we call it tongue? And I think it's because we let world in, we let worlds in and as well as we express ourselves out into the world with our tongue. So that's, uh, you know, to me, that symbolism was so powerful. And uh, it's just something which I carry with me. And um, I'm sure many or most immigrants do because they have to switch back and forth between different languages, different cultures, different foods, different sounds and sights and things like that. So um, yeah, but um, I think, you know, I am rethinking and processing my own experiences through my poetry. At least that is what I did at that stage when I was in my twenties and thirties. Now, I, now my trajectory is different. Um, now I want to tell stories which I think people have never heard before, which I have not heard before, and trying to piece together like a bigger history. But at first, I think here I was exploring my own personal history. So yeah, that, that's why I've written these poems. Yeah, that's just, just amazing and beautiful, uh, Shikha, to know the process behind it and also your thoughts behind it, how, uh, how you view the world through a certain lens. And uh, I'm sure you have another poem in, in reference to that to bring us that image together again. So this poem, it's, um, it's a fun one. Um, I grew up in Minnesota and lived there roughly on and off for I think um, 20, more than 20 years. And it's very different from the Bay Area. The Bay Area is much more diverse. There's so many different cultures. And um, I was amazed when I came here and we settled down in Cupertino actually. And um, to see like how many different ethnic stores there were, how many different cultures there were. Um, and I thought, you know what? People are speaking so many different languages. What would happen if they were switching back and forth between languages and their tongue actually froze? Because So I just imagined that there's some sort of an illness <laughs> That, that's like that and like what if this made the news the six o'clock news or something like that so this is called this just in in news of the weird a 30 year old woman was hospitalized in sunnyvale california this week when her tongue froze in the process of switching accents no word yet on which languages she was switching between witnesses at the scene say it was a challenging transition between talking with an ethnic shopkeeper, the woman's child and a friend who all spoke in different tongues. This is the first case of what doctors refer to as lingua gelatio in the state of California after three cases were reported in New York earlier this year. Bilingual and trilingual people are urged to exercise caution as there is no known cure for lingua gelatio. The hospitalized woman is currently undergoing rehabilitation and communicates via written messages, hand gestures, and grunts. <laughs> that was an indeed a fun piece. And uh, I am certainly going to exercise caution because I do speak more than two tongues. So <laughs> thank I, you for I sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please, Shikha, uh, let's hear another one and then maybe we can pause again. Sure. So um, this next poem is called Hindu. And I'm, um, you know, I consider myself a spiritual person, but I'm not religious at all. And, you know, sometimes I'd see my grandmothers and other family members like, you know, this week we have to fast because it's this, you know, festival and we have to, you know, perform this ritual. And, you know, I wonder why do people go through so much trouble with ritual, you know, sometimes. I mean, it, it can be very elaborate sometimes. And, you know, the, I feel like sometimes the spirituality gets lost, but it's also so beautiful. So I wrote this poem about that. Hindu, must I be prostrate before the gods and ring the bell and light some wicks to tell you and myself that I am a Hindu? To me, it is a show to think that God wants a pungent stick of smoke waved in his face and that he needs a bell to be woken up. That I like the smell of incense is another story or that I like wicks to see them glow in brown palms like white diamonds and the bells, they're for waking up the sleeping priest, the one who dusts 
God's feet. Thank you. Thanks, Shikha. So uh, in these poems uh, that you're sharing from your debut collection, uh, Geography of Tongues, uh, I see that they explore identity and language through your ethnicity and uh, cultural lens. Uh, in your writing as someone who's acknowledging uh, these cultural slippages between the diasporic community and the source land, uh, how do you see your relationship with your reader? Um, that's a really interesting question because, you know, I, I think I was very conscious of being the other when I was growing up because I grew up in a place that was predominantly um, white, um, Christian, and I was always made to feel like I was the other. And I understood that, you know, I was a minority by population and otherwise, but I also thought that, you know, this is for me to educate. I mean, this is an opportunity for me to also educate people about my culture and for me also to understand my culture because I was growing up in a different culture than my own. So um, there's, I think, constant negotiation through one's work, you know? Um, and I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I uh, get uh, uh, what you're saying. And I was, uh, I was wondering whether, um, do you find it, uh, there is any kind of gap between the poems that uh, are trying to communicate or express a certain thing, knowing that the reader may not belong to that certain culture or uh, may not identify with them immediately or may take time. So uh, that was what I was thinking, that how, how do you see your relationship to the reader as? Well, I, I feel like when I read a poem about another culture, right? I might not know everything and you can draw inferences, but I think the act of discovery is so beautiful that if there's something I don't understand, I'm going to go and search for it, whether it's on the internet or otherwise. And I hope the reader whoever reads my poems, that is, I hope they'll feel compelled to do the same. And so that's why I don't necessarily provide a glossary um, in right. the poems themselves, but at the back of my book, I think I have um, indicated. But um, now in this day and age with Google or, or with um, search engines, um, I think it's very easy to leave things in a certain way, the way you want it to, because for me, being bilingual, I switch back and forth. And so in my poems that I presently write, there's a lot of switching back and forth. And, right. um, you know, I don't know if everyone is going to be able to access that, but I hope they'll try, you know? Uh, I hope so too, because I, I see that it's, uh, it's an easier medium in a way to acquaint yourselves uh, with a completely different culture or, or even if you belong to the culture in some way, like someone born here, but they belong, they have their roots or their ancestors in India or in another country. Uh, it's wonderful to find that connect with the poems that they come across. So, yeah. Uh, and I feel like know. there's so many words that we have imbibed, you know, into our own, you know, lexicon, whether it's like, you know, so many people come up to me and say namaste, you know, <laughs> and that's because, you know, whether it's through yoga, whether it's through other things, they've learned that or like, you know, if, if we say, you know, um, hola or things like that, right? I mean, these are all things, I mean, all these languages, all these cultures have just become enmeshed. And I think that's going to happen even more where we'll all be in some ways bilingual and trilingual because of, you know, all the different cultures we're interacting with. True, here true, Idaho. absolutely. And uh, uh, can we have one more poem from the Geography of Tongues, yes. uh, Shikha? So, um, you know, my country is very famous for its mangoes. <laughs> and, um, you know, the mangoes are a very hotly contested fruit um, among the literary community here because they're like, oh, it's exotic, you know, and uh, we don't want to pander to that. But, you know, if that's the culture we come from and we eat mangoes, there's nothing wrong about writing about mangoes. So uh, this was actually a writing exercise that, um, when I, I lived in, in India briefly for, well, six years, and we were in a group and we're like, damn it, we're going to write about mangoes and we're going to see what happens, right? So um, this poem resulted from that and it's called Mad About Mangoes. 
You might think that it sounds cliched and exotic, but I'm going to write about mangoes as if my life depended on it. I can hear you snickering when they say, her breasts are like juicy mangoes. And then your disbelief when you look and realize they actually are. In the Mahabharata, they call it the complete fruit. Sampurn, eat a mango and all needs are satisfied, all nutrition delivered. Mangoes can be salvation, the shape of the ear of the Buddha, a paisley embroidered on silk, carved on doors. And if you must eat them, buy them by the crate, then soak them in a bucket and cool them, for each mango has the sun burning within it. Of course, size matters and color too. The small raw green ones taste good grated, salted, pickled, and the bigger fleshy ones have threads that get stuck between teeth. And the ones that are not so big or so small, they're the sweetest of them all. Puncture a hole in its head and suck until deflated, until its yellow blood stains your teeth. Lastly, be thankful you're not the Bollywood vamp Mango Dolly who captured Indian cowboy Quick Gun Murugan's heart and took a bullet for him because being named after a fruit spells trouble. <laughs> so Thank you so much, that. Shita. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that was amazing. Uh, absolute fun to hear that piece. And uh, so, coming back to, uh, to the to the theme we are celebrating in and the heritage months that we are honoring. Um, Asian American is sort of an umbrella term. And although we see uh, a broadening of its definition, uh, many still do not know of the vastness of the ethnic and uh, cultural diversity it still holds. Uh, how do you identify with the, the term Asian American, uh, especially at a time when we see uh, quite a bit of uh, anti-Asian sentiments at a rise. Well, um, as you said, it is an umbrella term. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a term which I have been negotiating and I'm still negotiating because, for example, as a writer, you have to submit a bio when you're doing a reading and other things. And sometimes I write Indian American, sometimes I write Indo-American, sometimes I write South Asian American. And it gets very confusing to me and especially with the hyphen you know what am I you know and and does it matter do I really have to define myself how can you define yourself when you're more than one thing you know so um to me it it it, it is a bit of a nuisance to be honest with you to, to have to slap on a label of some sort but I am of Indian heritage I am also American um but I and I, and I used to think about it a lot, especially when I was the other, when I was growing up, I went through a lot of racism. So I felt like I am Indian, I am not American. But then as I grew older and I um, you know, became an adult and I found my place in this world, I, I realized I could have the best of both worlds. And so I'm that. And for now, I mean, I made my peace. Yes, I'm Indian American or Indo-American, you know, whatever anybody wants to see me as, it's fine. Um, I know that both are, you know, dear to me, but but I don't like having to put a label. <laughs> it is something that is a nuisance to me. Yeah. No, but, that's uh, true, uh, Shika. Oh, please, sorry, you were saying something. No, no, and Asia is so vast, right? So, um, yeah. you know, when you speak of Asian, like normally people have a tendency to think, okay, China, right? And right. so then you say East Asian or South Asian or, you know, it, so it can be confusing. It's a big continent. So, um, and then especially when, when, you know, people say, where are you from? And I'll be like, California. No, but where are you really from? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I do get that as well, very mm -hmm. often. So, and it's it's true, I think, when you're in the process also, especially uh, honing the art of writing and, and right, right. making yourself known in that world of literature, I often wonder how it is for uh, when you segregate it into like South Asian American literature, which is like a category in itself, but but it's not it hasn't received as much exposure. So people are still recognizing it and, and it's wonderful to see that there are still some uh, platforms that highlight uh, and bring about uh, different poets and, and 
all these different continents which exist are becoming more visible. Absolutely. So, no, it's we're living in a I think culturally we're living in a golden age. And I say this in the sense that, you know, because I grew up in the, you know, 80s, it was a very different time then. So for me, but my children haven't seen what I've seen, right? Um, so this yeah. this to me in in a sense is a golden age. And um I just hope it gets better because platinum age. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, and also uh, in your in the introduction of you uh, that I gave, uh, this would be your seventh season as a poetry mentor in yeah. AWP's Writer to Writer program. So right. um, as an author representing the diverse community of South Asian writers, uh, how has your experience been like uh, mentoring writers of color? It's actually been fantastic. Um, um, first of all, the platform that AWP has provided is a really wonderful one. They match you um, with a mentee. They give you a choice. You know, they, they'll send you like five applications and you get to choose, but they they choose very carefully, even when they forward you the applications. And um, I said I wanted to work with people um, of cover, uh, color, especially, um, you know, South Asian um, writers, because they often don't have uh, community. Uh, the writing community is very small. And so um, when I met with them, all of them had the same, um, you know, uh, challenges in some ways where they had trouble finding community, which is sad but sh and shocking, but also true because, um, you know, when it comes to the arts, while we come from a really rich heritage of the arts, here, or, or it's not just here, I guess you could say it's in India as well, but there's so much focus on success through the sciences, through STEM, that um, what we do as writers is often looked upon as a hobby and you don't get that same kind of respect. And people are like, oh yeah, you can have a real job and then you can write on the side, which unfortunately, because we don't get compensated in the same way we have to do, right? But um, Th th these were some of the challenges which, you know, I've, I was really happy that I could, you know, give them support and make them feel a sense of community and help them find more solidarity. But um, in general, I feel that our South Asian community can definitely have more solidarity. We seem very scattered. Yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. And, and it's wonderful that you are bringing in these voices uh, through your poetry, Shikha. Uh, and before moving on to uh, the next uh, set that you offer to us. I'd just like to uh, say that uh, the next set and collection of poems uh, that Shikha will read uh, is a sequence of poems. So it's it's like a story uh, that you hear from the first piece towards the end that she takes us through. So throughout the sequence, I won't be uh, budging in at all uh, and, and interrupting uh, with any questions. Uh, maybe one question towards the end uh, that we'll wait for, but uh, please go ahead, Shikha, whenever you're ready. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and I just want to say, um, you know, you, you're, the work you're doing is so extraordinary and the platform you're providing and the things you're curating and that's all part of community building. So thank you, Monica. And, you know, I, I just wish you much success and building, out, building that out further. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Shikha. It means a lot. Um, okay, so this, um, the poems I'm going to be sharing now, um, they're um, from my forthcoming book, In Her Own Voice, Poems of Anandi by Joshi, and they're historical persona form, uh, poems that I've written, and um, they're based on the life of Anandi Gopal Joshi, who is also widely known as Anandi Bai, and uh, she lived from 1865 to 1887. Now, Anandi Bai was India's first female physician and the first Indian woman to enter the United States in 1883 to pursue an education in medicine. And how I came upon her was um, when I was, uh, basically I was searching for who the first Indian woman was to come to the United States. For most um, Indian immigrants um, in the United States, our history in this land, it just goes back to one generation or maybe two at the most. So. In the case of my family, my, my parents were first generation immigrants, but I knew there, there were people before us and I, and I couldn't find that anywhere, like in a history book or um, any other type of book which contained this information. So then 
I went on the internet and I thought, well, who was the first Indian woman who came here? And that's when I discovered Anandi Bai's life story. And it's a really compelling story of empowerment and American and Indian allyship back in the 19th century. And um, Anandi Bai had to break a lot of, you know, social conventions and she had to buck tradition um, and she crossed the ocean, which at that time was labeled as, you know, tabooed black waters in order to come here and pursue an education. And that too, to become a doctor, which was mostly men. So until really um, recently, her story has been told through the lens of her husband being her savior and inspiration. Um, and while he did encourage her, it was often by coercion and violence. So by telling Anandi Bai's story through poems in her own imagined voice, my hope is to not only restore her agency and give her story back to her, but to also highlight you know, her determination and her desire to help other women. So um, this resulted into a whole book, which I wrote during the pandemic. So I'll be sharing um, some of her poems um, um, in poems of her life with you. So Anandi, Boy, Anandi Bai was born in Kalyan, Maharashtra on March 31st, 1865 in a busy port town that is um, now a suburb of present day Mumbai. She was born into privileged, into a high caste Hindu Brahmin family that was well respected, even though they'd fallen on hard times. One of her family's biggest concerns was that Anandi Bai had reached the age of eight and was still not married. And at, at that time, child marriages were the norms. So this poem gives a glimpse into Anandi Bai's daily life at that age, that tussle between wanting to be a child and play freely, yet adhering to the traditional patriarchal expectations that were imposed at a very young age. To touch the sky. The sun's shadow swept over my face as I built biceps drawing water from the well, rope burns on my hands and wrists, and when I complained there was no time to play, eyes anger drew welts on my back, her orders a daily refrain. Gather sticks for the chulha, scrub the pakshala. So when I found the zopara empty, I grabbed its chains as if a horse's reins, pumping my legs furiously to see how high I could go. Braids flying, skirt rippling, sun winking, toes trying to touch the sky, my only witness a green pigeon whose wings I conspired to steal. So um, I just wanna say that some of the words in here will be in Hindi or in Marathi. And so, um, you know, I can share some of them with you. Like Zopara is like a wooden swing. Pakshala means kitchen. Chulha is a stove. So um, there will be words like that in, the subsequent poems as well. So at the ripe old age of nine, Anandi Bai was married to Gopal Rao Joshi, a widower 16 years older than her. Gopal Rao was an overzealously progressive man and he was instrumental in encouraging Anandi Bai to pursue an education, resorting to extreme behavior to get her to study. Um, unfortunately, he would often beat her, you know, if she didn't study. And he would throw her books and tear them, you know, that you don't want to study, so I'm going to rip them up. So he, he was, you know, in some ways, not a nice person at all. But ignoring the protests of Anandi Bai's family members who felt a woman's place was tending to family, not going to school. Um, oh, sorry. Ignoring the protests of Anandi Bai's family members who felt a woman's place was tending to family um, and not going to school, Gopal Rao emphasized learning English so that Anandi could pursue her dream of becoming a doctor, which arose from the loss of her son, which she gave birth to at the age of 14. Due to lack of access to medical care and the reluctance of Indian women to see male doctors who were often mostly European, Anandi Bai lost her son when he was 10 days old. Anandi Bai's husband moved from place to place, city to city in order for her to get an education. So Anandi learns English. Kolhapur, Maharashtra, 1879. This new language is like balancing a marble on my tongue. The K in knife, silent. The T in brother, soft. Aji says, 
Why learn the bhasha of the Angres who don't bathe every day, who eat the flesh of animals like a jungle and call us heathen instead with our heads covered and our feet bare. But my husband, he brings me books in Aval Angrezi. He says, I must learn it all, their language, their God, their modern ways, anything to help us cross Kalapani, to hold their alphabets in my mouth and swallow before they roll away. So instead of like the word English, I've used Angrez and Angrezi, which means um, English in Urdu. And um, there are some other words there too, yeah. So now here's where the story becomes really interesting. So call it fate or serendipity that Anandi Bai's husband wrote a letter published in the Princeton Missionary Review that reached an American woman in New Jersey while she was in the dentist's waiting room. Anandi Bai's desire to become a doctor and help the women of her land resonated loudly with Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter. And she wrote to Anandi Bai immediately offering her friendship and support. Anandi Bai and Theodosia exchanged letters for three years before Anandi Bai set sail on the city of Calcutta steamship for the United States in 1883. Mrs. Carpenter, who Anandi came to regard as a second mother, was waiting with her husband to receive her and give her a home as she pursued her medical studies. So this poem is about how that happened. If it please God. Each time she tells the story, I'm convinced it isn't coincidence. Call it fate, Nasheed, aunt's eye falling on the dusty cover of the missionary review her tooth throbbing in the dentist's office as she flips through it till her eyes rest on my husband's plea. I should therefore, if it please God, like to take my wife to America for her being thoroughly educated. Our maker, surely one and the same, conspiring to shrink oceans and bring us closer. Three years later, I say goodbye to Serampur's dark shores, my new home now, Russell, New Jersey, where hope bursts open like a rose, giving let there be light new meaning, making history as the first town to be electrified by Thomas Edison a few months before I arrived as the first Maratha woman studying medicine. And I bask in this newly lit town under the love of another mother, another land where I can be myself, desirous of learning without others injurious glances, burning bright as a bulb. All right. So Anandi Bai was admitted to the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in the fall of 1883. And, a, and she was applauded for her courage in defying tradition and religion. She impressed all with her confidence and mastery of English, which she, while she maintained her culture and customs. In fact, it's um, a funny fact is that she got so used to speaking English that for a while she forgot her own mother tongue, Marathi. <laughs> but above all, uh, it was Anandi Bai's determination to help her countrywoman that moved everyone she met. So this poem, it's, um, there was a reception for her to welcome her when she joined medical college. And um, there were like 500 people who came to meet her and shake her hand. So um, this poem is called, They Call Me Lady of the Orient. Though the darkest one in the room, I'm the brightest of them all, in a red pitambar sari, deem Pompeian bell of this ball. And as I shake their hands, 500 pairs wearing gloves to protect me, they regard the spray of pearls hanging from my nose, my filigreed wrists of bangles glinting gold, the tiny kunku dot on my forehead, broad forehead, drawing stares and praise for this young Brahmin lady so brave, having come all the way from Serampore to the city of brotherly love to earn her daughter's doctor's coat. Maze now Anandi Ahe, I want to say in my native tongue so that I don't forget who I am, the young girl whose books once lay tattered in the cow shed, whose baby lived barely 10 days. I float like an Indian rose among a dull sea of cinched waists and bonnets in the parlor of the Dean of the Women's Medical College smiling till my cheeks hurt as they stumble out a new version of my name, Ananda Bai, remarking how exquisite is my English. 
Are we doing okay on time? Uh, yes, Shikha, it should okay. be fine. Please uh, go ahead. Okay. Sure. So um, Anandi Bai was received with so much warmth and kindness by the American people, and she wanted to return the hospitality. Imagine that in 1883, in the town of Russell, New Jersey, Anandi Bai cooked a traditional Marathi feast of 18 dishes in the home of her host, Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter, serving her hosts as well as their friends, Indian style, sitting cross-legged on the floor, teaching all of them to eat with their hands. Anandi Bai even lent all of the women guests her saris and jewelry for the special night. So, um, you know, this poem was a challenge because I wanted to write about this dinner and I thought, what would be the best way to do this? And somehow the guzzle form came together for this. So um, I'm gonna share that with you and I hope you like it. When the guests sup as gods, a guzzle. In my wildest dreams, never do I fathom tonight that I should turn them into feasting Indians tonight. Not those whose vast plains they call their own, but proud Marathas from my faraway native tonight. All the fair ladies draped in woven bordered saris, hands bangled, necks spangled, shining bright tonight. As they swish across the inlaid floor like princesses in my colorful trousseau that belongs to them tonight. 18 squares hand-drawn in red and white powder on the dining room floor where guests sup as gods tonight. Set with plates stitched from broad buttonwood leaves, a rich meal of spice, vegetables, and fruit await all tonight. After a Sanskrit prayer blessing this feast is chanted, all eyes look up to me on how to proceed tonight. No spoons, no forks, nor knives, just their pale bare hands, sampling 18 exotic dishes prepared by myself tonight. Fashioning small balls out of their food with pink fingertips, they pop them into their mouths like all of India does tonight. The meal ends with a serenade and sprinkling of rose water, bouquets of fresh plucked flowers given to each guest tonight. Oh, Anandi, see the red kunku and all their white foreheads, how the love of my new sisters makes this heart swell tonight. Then this next poem gives a glimpse into Anandi Bai's life in the United States as a medical student. Um, Anandi Bai was constantly falling sick and yet she approached life here with wonder, curiosity, and gratitude. She was unaware though that she had tuberculosis. Despite her poor health, Anandi Bai managed to complete her studies and impress all those around her. Ebony, Ivory, and Silk, 1884. Over my doctor's white coat and the black beaded Mangal Sutra, that lay snugly against my chest as proof of marriage. Tips of ivory in each ear, connected by tubes wrapped in fine silk, forming a parabola, a conduit of sound from which hangs an ebony medallion, confirming proof of life through the steady gallop of beating heart and burbling lungs. And I wonder how this is not considered a type of precious jewelry as well, the stethoscope worn, by a rare few of my sex. So Mangal Sutra is an auspicious thread or necklace in um, Hinduism, which a groom fastens on the bride during their marriage ceremony, which signifies a joining of two souls. And the woman's never supposed to take it off. So I just imagine how she would have her Mangal Sutra while she was a student and then have the stethoscope maybe on top of it. Now the two would be side by side and, and sort of, the, these two different identities of hers, how they sort of come together. So that's how this poem arose. Yeah. And um, so this next poem is really special to me because it's based on an iconic black and white photograph, the one that pulled me into this journey. And it's, it's a, it, this photograph actually went viral on the internet and it shows um, three um, medical students um, uh, Anandi Bai on one side, and then a Japanese um, student, and then a Syrian student, all women who had come from their respective countries uh, to study medicine, and then be the first doctors, the first female doctors of their own country. So this photograph, you know, they're, they're all standing very seriously, and they're dressed in their native clothes, and like the Syrian doctor is holding a lyre or, uh, or 
a harp of some sort. Um, the Japanese doctor's holding um, a fan, I believe, and Anandi Bai has her hands folded. So um, there's so much going on in that photograph. There's this like exotic, you know, there are a lot of exotic ramifications to it. Um, like, you know, the fetishization of cultures, things like that. But the photograph also shows or rather radiates the strength and resilience of, you know, them saying we are here. So um, I was really drawn to it. And um, I, I wrote a poem uh, based on that photograph. When they ask us to pose for a photograph at the Women's Medical College reception. Forgive us if we don't smile. The ocean scent still on our clothes, still on our clothes, the stench of sea. We visitors of another clime, a warmer lands are we. With pride, we wear our native clothes, silks and jewels we proudly don. Sari, kimono, headdress of coins, with lyre, sash, a handheld fan, no scalpel, stethoscope, or degree. Three female doctors of foreign pedigree playing dress up for Western eyes. In our appearance, they see worlds wild. Forgive us if we don't smile. So um, Anandi Bai graduated from medical school within three years at the age of 21 and returned to India in 1886. While she was criticized and maligned for wanting to leave India to pursue an education, on returning with her medical degree, she was celebrated and hailed as an example for other Indian women. Anandi Bai was supposed to serve as the physician in charge of the female ward of Albert Edward Hospital in Kolhapur, but passed away from tuberculosis on February 26, 1887, right before she turned 22. After being cremated as per her wish, her husband sent her ashes to Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter in New Jersey, where they are interred in Poughkeepsie, New York, with the Carpenter family. Her gravestone reads Anandi Bai, or actually they've misspelled her name, so it's Ananda Bai, first Brahmin woman to leave India and obtain an education. So those are my poems. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh yes, the photograph. I see that Moazam is showing that. Oh, thank you so much, Shikha. Uh, such such a brilliant uh, uh, chronicle of uh, the journey of Anandi Bai. Uh, it is absolutely amazing, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm really really happy to to hear that voice bring brought to life through your poems. And uh, I had uh, a question uh, regarding uh, this work of yours. Um, I find in her own voice so inventive and I personally think it is groundbreaking in its own right uh, with how it, it brings uh, this persona to life and all pieces are richly textured like uh, a line that stands out for me through all those verses is and because I also share the mother tongue with Anandi Bai, yes, yes. Uh, the Marathi language uh, and I quote the line it says, Maze now Anandi Ahe, which means my name is Anandi. I want to say in my native tongue so, so that I don't forget who I am. And uh, that is such an empowering line in, in its uh, own way. I think it encapsulates Anandi Bai's voice, uh, which you have so exquisitely captured in, uh, in the pieces. And uh, my question is how um, uh, I see that the persona piece straddles between genres and holds multiple spaces at a time. And uh, it is a historical piece. So we can see that it's almost feels like an epic poem. And then you you hear about the whole thing from the beginning to the end. Uh, so it's also like a biography. Uh, it is a social commentary on race and gender and identity. Uh, yeah. What What space does it inhabit in your own exploration of uh, making it? Um, one second, it's kind of dark in here. I'm gonna see if I can turn on the lamp. Sure. <laughs> I hope this helps a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a little better. Um, so um, what, uh, what space does it inhabit? Um, so it does straddle genres and, uh, and I'm very excited that it does. Uh, when I first you know, heard, of, heard of her story, 
I thought, okay, should I try and write it in novel form? And um, somehow, I, I mean, and I, I, uh, I first heard of her story in 2017, right? And I've primarily been a poet, even though I'm trained in um, journalism. Um, but I, I'd seen there were biographies of her and the two that I had read you know, they, they were, one was written by a, a Western um, feminist of the time and then uh, in the 19th century. And then another one was written by a, a Marathi scholar from the 20th century. And I thought, okay, there are people who have tried to tell her story and they, they've told it well in their own individual ways. Then there was a fictionalized novel of, of which was written about her in Marathi um, that was translated into English later, but I thought, where is her voice in this? And what would be the best way to bring out that voice? And I thought that poetry would work here because um, sadly, Anandi Bai had a very short life. If she'd had a very long one, I don't know. It would have been very difficult maybe to capture that through poetry. But because she had such a small life, but she did so much, mm -hmm. I thought that poetry would be the best way to be able to convey her story through her own imagined voice, you know? And um, I don't know, I mean, it wasn't conscious on my part that this is also going to be a biography and this is also going to be this and that, but I think the very nature of the way her life was lived, all these issues just come into play and it just, you know, it, it, it was exactly somehow what I also love to do is to look at different threads and try and tie and tie them together. So it, it, it sort of like was a match made in heaven in some strange way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. It was absolutely brilliant to hear that and uh, so enriching. And uh, thank you again, Shikha, for um, I feel newly educated and, and so, so grateful for the knowledge uh, you have shared through the poems tonight. Uh, and your writing itself is so effervescent with beautiful narration that you give, uh, which makes this listening experience uh, so, so hearty. Um, I'll just give uh, a minute or two for, uh, to everyone, uh, if anyone would like to unmute themselves and uh, briefly uh, open for question or comment. Uh, and I encourage everyone uh, to have a word with Shikha while I share some of her links in the chat, uh, which all of you can save later. Please. I would just like to say, I don't know why I don't have a camera tonight, but I can see you fine. It was wonderful. It called to mind so many things for me, both kind of in the earlier section of your reading when you were talking about naming and the humor that was there. And in the second part, it sounds unrelated, but my mother-in-law grew up in Florida. She moved to Baldwinsville, New York, and that was one of the first places in the country that was electrified because there was a power plant there and they had to, they had, they, they called it town and gown. And so one half of the town was, you know, didn't quite fit the standard, but she learned so much there that she was so open that when she moved to California, they had two African women who came and stayed with them for several years there still are African sisters and it, it's always so wonderful to, to get these connections. You know, somebody said, you know, don't ever laugh at somebody who doesn't speak your language with an accent because that means they already speak another language and you don't. So, so anyway, I wanted to thank you so much. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have something. Um, I'm Rosemary, and I really uh, appreciated you using poetry to actually be be um, this beautiful woman that only lived till she was 22 and who did so much. And the story is so compelling. It really needed we needed to hear her voice, and we needed to to really know her. And I think that poetry is the best medium for it. So thank you for doing that. I mean, you can't just describe her, um, you know, a, a biography, you're gonna hear, you're gonna read a description. And uh, it was just wonderful. And I just wanted to tell you on your tongues, um, <laughs> I was in, I had to go to speech class when I was uh, first started school and go like that around a pencil because I had an accent 
And so they tried, they took it away from me with a pencil. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> that's a, the, that should be a poem in itself. <laughs> so interesting. It's, but that, that's why that was so interesting to me about the tongues. <laughs> wow. No, thank you. I mean, it's very reaffirming to hear that, um, you know, that you feel that poetry is the best form to tell her story. Um, while I was doing research, I just want to mention this, that um, there are so many fantastic um, Black writers who have taken historical persona poetry to explore their history and tell their history. And um, I was so moved by some of the um, voices and stories that I heard through these um, poets, such as Olio by Taihim Bajes, which um, he wrote in the voice of different um, Black performers who um, whose stories would be lost because they weren't recorded, right? Um, like um, the first uh, African-American or Black opera singer. Um, then there were uh, people who performed in the circus and different carnivals and things like that. So um, Olio is one such book. Then um, there's this book on um, Phyllis Wheatley, who was the first Black poet. And I think she was from the 18th century. And um, I came across that book. Then there was another book um, called Anarcha Speaks, which was about um, enslaved Black women who had gynecological experiments done on them by the a father of modern gynecology, J, um, what is his name, J. Marion Sims, I believe. And so these are, sometimes stories are so painful and poetry is the way which you can explore and tell them. And not just painful stories, but also other historical, importantly, I mean, important historical events, which might seem boring in another medium. <laughs> I think poetry is a great way to, to capture that and explore that. So I hope all of you, you know, will maybe look and check out these other stories as well that are out there in poetry form. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Shikha. I'm really uh, happy that all of us got a chance to hear uh, all your poems and especially the sequence of poems. Although uh, at the end, uh, we were running out of time a little bit. I really wanted everyone to listen to the entire piece, which, which lets it all come together. So uh, thank you everyone for being patient and, and listening and uh, thanks Shikha. I personally enjoyed very much having this evening to chat with you and hear your work. And I look forward to all your new work as it appears. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. Thanks everybody for coming on this Tuesday night. Yeah. And uh, with that, uh, we are going to stop recording now. Uh, those of you who are in the Zoom room, uh, please stay online for the open mic segment of the evening. Uh, to the YouTube audience, thanks for joining in and hope to see you for next month's virtual Belmont Poetry Night. Thank you so much.